Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, we find out how the Space Force, just weeks after its formation, tracked an Iranian missile attack on U.S. troops. We get updates on new Army uniform and grooming regulations. And hear from the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps about issues the Corps is tackling in 2021. We'll also take a look at a cheating scandal at the Air Force Academy. And hear from the Defense News reporters on some of the biggest stories they're watching early in the new year. With the latest news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Andrea Scott. We've got a very full show for you this week, beginning with updates from the Army. Sweeping changes to grooming and uniform regulations were recently passed by the Army to update everything from hairstyles to breastfeeding guidance. Lipstick and ponytails for women and clear nail polish for men are now on the menu. Military Times' Ben Murray has more. A wide-ranging set of changes to uniform and grooming regulations is set to hit the Army, with a ton of new details covering everything from ponytails to earring allowances. Decided by a panel of 17 soldiers, including a mix of men and women from different races, the changes were mostly set with practicality in mind, but included a high number of expanded allowances for women. We looked at the recommendations. Um, the panel made those recommendations to the senior leaders, and we said, yeah, these are great, and that's what we're going to roll out today. Among the more attention-grabbing, women will now be able to wear long ponytails in some situations, such as physical training and when wearing certain tactical gear, such as the advanced combat helmet or combat vehicle crewman helmet. To be able to have the option for taking your, your bun down in a ponytail and tucking that hair in the back of your, you know, your, your neck down in your Army combat uniform coat in order to be able to put that helmet on so it can sit mm -hmm. without it impairing your vision or making it uncomfortable when you're trying to execute you know, effective training or combat operations. Women can also now go short. Shaved heads are now allowed for women with minimum hair lengths erased in the latest update. Female soldiers were going through certain training such as ranger school and decided to shave their head again to be more inclusive with their peers that they were training with. Technically, they were out of regulation. We wanted to take it further. You know, should we just only be for school? It should be for a woman's identity overall. It's a woman's choice to have hair or not, and that's something we really want to get after as well. Highlights in soldiers' hair are also now in the mix for those who want to add a little color, but they can't be too stark and have to blend naturally. You know, it, it, hair dyes are already authorized, uh, but we want to take this further. You know, hey, you know, female soldiers, even male soldiers, they want to, you know, have an opportunity to, you know, kind of jazz it up a little bit, you know. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, it's part of your identity. We really talked a little bit about what is a natural color. And that natural color is not your natural color, it's a natural color that can be worn, you know, for your highlights as a uniform blended color. Uh, so this was one we really looked at, you know, from the, the psychological realm of how do we increase productivity. And, and when you do that, it's really building upon the identity of the soldier. And that's something we really looked at in the recommendation of highlights. You mentioned yourself, so are you, are you implying that, that this highlight standard is gender neutral? It is gender neutral. Women are now also allowed to wear earrings while in combat uniforms, as long as they're not in the field or on combat duty. I know we're all excited about the earrings. I am especially, but we're not going to move to it yet. We're going to wait till the Alarite come out, right, Sergeant Major Clark and Sergeant Major Sanders? Yes, 30 days from now, 670-1 comes into effect, mm -hmm. and then an Alarite uh, will follow um, after that authorizing um, the, the wear of earrings. So wait for the Alarag before you, you know, decide to don your earrings. That's very key. And lipstick and nail polish are now approved in solid colors, as long as the colors aren't extreme, like gold or hot pink. You know, you just got to make sure when it comes to that professional and we say these extreme colors, you know, that's not, you know, your yellows, your blues, your purples, you know, those are definitely the unprofessional extreme colors that we don't want. Also, men can now wear clear nail polish a move to help protect their nails if working with chemicals or from other damage. 
In addition to cosmetic and grooming changes, uniform regs were also opened up for nursing moms. A new change allows women to wear specifically designed breastfeeding t-shirts as part of their uniform to go with specifications that they can open up their coats or uniform tops to breastfeed as needed. Now approved and ready to roll, the new regulations are set to take effect on February 25th. Check out our story on armytimes.com for more. Thanks, Ben. And now from the Marines. Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Troy Black, is hosting two summits in February aimed at defining what it means to be a 21st century Marine and how the Corps wants to increase leadership responsibilities for NCOs. Marine Corps Times spoke to Black before the events. Here's just some of that conversation. How's it going, Sergeant Major? It's going good, Phil. It's good to see you. This particular summit has a lot of, uh, the Rifleman Summit, has a lot of, you know, junior Marines coming in, you know, corporals, lance corporals, lieutenants, captains. How important is it to talk to them and get them involved in this discussion early on in their careers? It answers the question you asked me a moment ago. How do we keep them engaged? Is to place some of the ownership there. Uh, I will tell you my, my experience as a young Marine, my first duty station was on sea duty. Um, and then I went to Desert Storm as a Lance Corporal and got promoted to Corporal. I can't imagine that the ensuing 10 years, literally, since after Desert Storm, we got into a, a really big engagement. Never mind Somalia was an engagement. We did several NEOs, other operations low intensity conflict, military operations other than war during the 1990s. But my experience as a corporal allowed me to influence all the way through the time that I was a senior staff sergeant, how the force was going to be shaped, how I trained and educated Marines, how I was trained and educated in order literally to after 9-11 be ready to go. So, so I think it's invaluable to have all ranks and grades of Marines involved in a conversation about what the war fighting ethos of the institution is. Otherwise, it's a bunch of old folks sitting around a table telling the young folks what it's, what it's about without actually fully having the buy in. You know, switching to the staff and CO summit, um, you know, how important is it to you know get the staff and CO, some who have combat experience, some who don't, depending on exactly when they came in and what their MOSs was, you know, to understand that you know it's your job to pass on your their your experience um, to the junior Marines. And what are you? Is that something that's not occurring now, or is that something you want to happen more often? Yeah, the latter. Mm -hmm. I think in the case of our staff non-commissioned officers, first, let me make sure I'm clear on this. Our non-commissioned mm -hmm. officers are the backbone of our institution. However, our non-commissioned officers are still being mentored, trained, and led by staff non-commissioned officers. Additionally, every new lieutenant that graduates TBS goes to an organization, and they have a staff non-commissioned officer there that's there to continue their development, indoctrination, their transformation into a Marine. The staff non-commissioned officer is pivotal. Without reciting, I'd ask you just maybe go take a look at the staff non-commissioned officer creed. And it really sets the responsibilities of a staff NCO to the institution. They're important. One of the lines I pull out that's most important to me is strive constantly for perfection, knowing no mortal has ever achieved it. I'm responsible as a staff non-commissioned officer, all staff NCOs are, to constantly strive for perfection, whether it's in combat, whether it's training to go to combat, whether it's being an administrator, whether it's in garrison, whether it's on liberty, my goal is to set the example that perfection will ensure that we are successful in the battlefield. What is the Marine Corps doing to give these staff and COs the support they need to, you know, near perfection as, as close as humanly possible? So I think I think I'd be very careful in my response because I want to make sure that we're clear. Mm -hmm. The proposition is not that our staff non-commissioned officers are not capable of more or that we're failing in our training or our education or our opportunities for them to develop experience through deployments, enhanced training in their MOSs, et cetera. It's the opposite. With some adjustment, we can always improve what makes someone better at their job. My proposition is to tell the officers, give more responsibility to the staff and CEO so they can step back and they can do things that are more in, within, in line with their ability to improve their performance. If the substance the commandant has on force design or right, that we have to be able to find areas to push responsibility to the lowest level possible, then we have to find time to equip individuals 
with the responsibilities they need to execute that. It's not going to be a captain or a major always on the long range fire position in EAB. It may very well be a staff sergeant or a gunnery sergeant. Give them responsibility now to develop trust to be able to execute that environment. Thanks, Philip. And finally, from the Air Force this week, nearly 250 cadets from the Air Force Academy are suspected of cheating on exams and other assignments. Academy officials are looking into what they say are a variety of potential offenses that developed during a rapid shift to remote learning during the pandemic. The allegations include cadets looking up test answers from unauthorized sites and taking exams in groups. Two cadets have been dismissed so far. And that was a look at some of your military headlines for this week. When we come back, a look at how the Space Force may have saved lives just weeks after it was stood up, when Iran fired missiles at a base in Iraq. Space Force became a new service on December 20th, 2019, and a few weeks later in January, it was put to the test when Iran launched more than a dozen ballistic missiles at U.S. and coalition forces in Iraq. Earlier, I spoke with C4 ISR Net's Nathan Strout about his exclusive story, highlighting how Space Force's second Space Warning Squadron at Buckley Air Force Base, Colorado, saved lives. Nathan, welcome. Walk us through what happened in Iraq in January 2020 and how Space Force took part. Yeah, so on January 7th, 2020, uh, Iranian forces launched about a dozen ballistic missiles at U.S. and coalition forces based in Iraq. Uh, and what happened was, is that uh, personnel from the newly established Space Force, formerly airmen, members of the Air Force, uh, who operate a infrared sensor on orbit, on satellites, were able to detect those incoming missiles and give a early warning to troops at that location to seek cover. Uh, and Space Force leaders have credited that early warning with saving lives. Now at that point, Space Force was new as a service. Was that unit built from scratch in a few weeks or had it been an existing military unit beforehand? Yeah, so in essence, Space Force is uh, a rejiggered version of Air Force Space Command. So, so these, uh, these personnel, the squadron that uh, we're talking about, they, they were an Air Force squadron beforehand. So really we're talking about a name change uh, the Space Force had just been established and this first year has really been about organizing. So the, the difference on the ground is not as substantial as you might think. So even though it was an existing unit, it's still a remarkable feat. It's also impressive that they could monitor such an attack. What kind of technology was involved? Yeah, so uh, shortly after the attack, we learned that it was an early warning system that had given this early warning. Uh, we weren't sure what exactly what system that was, but we had some suspicions. Uh, Space Force eventually confirmed that it was the space-based infrared system, so SIBRS. Uh, this is a constellation of uh, about a half dozen satellites up in geosynchronous orbit that use infrared sensors to detect basically, you know, infrared signals anywhere on Earth. So these things are monitoring the, the globe 24-7, uh, every single inch of the Earth, detecting uh, anything that's going to look like a ballistic missile launch. So is SIBRS the space-based infrared system used only to catch missile launches, or is it a general use system? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it'll pick up anything, right? So a wildfire, they're going to see that. Ballistic missile, uh, the launch of a satellite into space, uh, regularly scheduled thing, that's going to get picked up by these satellites. Really anything. But uh, th this system can kind of give the operators an idea of what missile's being launched, uh, you know, what type, where it's heading, uh, given the, the information they need to let people know uh, what's inbound. So it's impressive that they pulled this off in the first few weeks of its existence. Um, what has Space Force been up to in the year since? Yeah, so the Space Force has started swearing in new members, um, setting up their headquarters, uh, getting an idea of what their organization is going to look like. They've uh, established the first of three subcommands that are going to sort of form the big organization of the Space Force. Uh, they put up policy documents. Uh, really, this first year has been about organization and setting up what it's going to look like over the next few years. Uh, as far as systems and people on the ground, a lot of it's been a strong continuation of what Air Force Space Command looked like. Okay, so Space Force is now more established, and this happened more than a year ago. Why is this story important to tell now? Yeah, I think it's the perfect story to sort of exemplify what the Space Force does versus what uh, we think the 
the Space Force does, right? It's not some sci-fi organization. They're not going into space. They're not flying starfighters. Uh, they're working on the ground. They, their bases are in America. Uh, this squadron is based in Colorado. They sit behind monitors. They uh, control the satellites. They process the data that comes off them. Uh, so, so this story kind of exemplifies what they do and the actual real world, world implications of their capabilities. Nathan, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me, Daniel. You can read Nathan's exclusive story on C4ISRNet.com. And now for defense industry headlines. The U.S. Army is heading into a culminating event used to evaluate four different unmanned aerial systems capable of replacing the service's current tactical UAS, the Textron Made Shadow. The service will hold a rodeo at Fort Benning, Georgia, the last week of February through the first week of March. Taking part will be all five of the Brigade Combat Teams, or BCTs, that spent the last year evaluating future tactical UAS systems. That's according to Brigadier General Wally Rugen, who's in charge of Army Aviation Modernization and recently spoke to Defense News. The Army will brief senior leaders attending the event on the data that resulted from the evaluations the BCTs did in 2020. The 1st Brigade Combat Team of the 82nd Airborne Division was the last to wrap up its evaluation at the end of the year. Each unit was provided just one of the candidate systems, so the rodeo will bring each of the aircraft back onto one playing field. Coming out of the year-long evaluation period, Rugen said that he was hopeful that the Army would get a revolutionary, not evolutionary, new tactical UAS capability that isn't tied to a runway, has a lower acoustic signature, and far lower equipment requirements in order to transport the system within a unit. The U.S. Army is evaluating Israeli defense company's Rafael's shoulder-launched, short-range version of its spike missile and demonstrated the capability at the Army Expeditionary Warrior Experiment 2021 in January. That's according to a statement that added that it was the first live-fire demonstration of Spike SR on U.S. soil. Rafael's Spike SR is a portable, electro-optical, anti-tank guided missile. It fits into a family of anti-tank guided missiles, including a long-range version and a, and a non line of sight or NLOS version. The U.S. Army has purchased an interim set of Spike NLOS missiles for its aviation fleet to urgently bring a precision guided munition capability to its formations. Spike SR weighs some 22 pounds and has a range of about 2 kilometers. The U.S. Defense Department announced that it awarded a $30.4 million contract to boost domestic processing of light rare earth elements as part of an effort to become less dependent on China for critical technologies. The Pentagon awarded the funds to Linus Rare Earths Limited, the world's largest rare earth element mining and processing company outside of China. The firm will use the funds to open a processing facility in Hondo, Texas, through the Australian company's U.S. subsidiary, Linus USA. The award is part of a broader push for the department to secure its rare earth supply chain, which is threatened by China's dominance in the industry, and move more production to the United States. China is the top producer of rare earth metals, which are a critical piece of defense systems like satellites or the F-35 fighter jet. That's all from around the defense industry this week. When we come back, we'll get tips for military members on managing credit card payments. And later, we'll hear from defense news reporters on stories they're tracking in 2021. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack delivers strategies on how to manage credit card payments. If you're still thinking credit cards should only be used for big purchases or emergencies, you're missing out on a great tool that can help manage a successful budget. Credit cards are great for everyday purchases, not just the unexpected expenses. The key to doing this right is having an equally great repayment strategy. Payment reminders and alerts are the way to consistently pay on time, which can lead to improving your credit score and eliminating fees. Then take it a step further. Set up automatic payments, a guarantee you'll be paying on time, all the time. If you can, pay more than the minimum every month. The quicker you reduce your debt, the less you pay in interest. And the real pro move is when you're collecting cash rewards or perks for your purchases, giving you the most value for your money. Take charge of your money management and see how your credit card can be the most powerful tool in your wallet. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more of our coverage, be sure to visit our websites at Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Times.com and DefenseNews.com. For our curated top stories in your inbox every day, subscribe to our early bird brief. 
And to keep up to date with all of our coverage, be sure to visit our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube pages. And do you know a fellow service member who might be worthy of an award? Nominate your fellow soldier, sailor, airman, or marine at servicemembersoftheyear.org slash nominate. And check out the categories for Veteran of the Year and Coast Guardsman of the Year. And when we come back, we'll hear about the top stories the defense news team is expecting to track in the coming year. Twenty twenty one is off to a running start, and with a new administration at the helm and new priorities in play for Pentagon and defense leaders, the stories the defense news reporters and editors are looking to track are evolving. For more on what they'll be watching out for, we check in with the team on this week's Reporters Roundtable. Welcome to this week's Reporters Roundtable. I'm Aaron Meta. Believe it or not, twenty twenty did actually come to an end. We are now in the year twenty twenty one, a couple weeks in, in fact. And so we wanted to get together with some of my Defense News colleagues, uh, Jen Judson, Valerie Sinna, and David Larder, to discuss what 2021 might bring for each of the military services. Uh, Val, I want to start with you. As the Air Force reporter, what are you watching for? What milestones are you tracking in the coming year? Well, I think like everyone, we're looking to see who the uh, officials that are going to be nominated for the service secretary. Um, so who becomes the next Air Force secretary? who becomes the next uh, Air Force acquisition exec, what are their priorities and how do they try to influence things? Um, I'm going to be looking especially at uh, programs like the Advanced Battle Management System and the Next Generation Air Dominance, which is the Air Force's future fighter, to think about, you know, are they going to stay on the same path that the Trump administration carved out? Um, the other thing I'm going to be keeping an eye on is the new Air Force Chief of Staff, um, who uh, was sworn in in August, he made accelerating change a big priority. Um, but so far, we haven't really seen that take hold. We haven't really seen any any meaningful changes made. So I think it's a big question about, is he actually able to accomplish his goals? And does the Air Force uh, start to change to look like a force that can compete against China? Great. Larder, same question uh, from a naval perspective. What are you watching for? Uh, aside from, of course, the obvious, you know, who's going to be coming into the services? Right. I think the 2021 is going to be a big year for the Navy. They are looking uh, very hard at their unmanned program. Uh, there's this uh, general sense that the Navy needs unmanned systems to spread sensors around and spe uh, spread capability around and boost the capability of the current fleet. But there's been a lot of skepticism in Congress about uh, the path that the Navy's chosen to get there. So I'm looking toward 2021 as a year where they're really going to try and figure out the best way forward for furthering unmanned systems. And then beyond that, fitting into this suit jacket again is what I'm looking to do in 2021. Yeah, it's going to be tricky for all of us. Uh, Jen, <laughs> last but certainly not least, tell us about the Army. What's going on this year? Well, Army Futures Command uh, has stood up over two years ago now, so they're well underway uh, in trying to execute their top priority programs. Uh, one of those is a hypersonic missile, uh, and that is actually a joint program with the Air Force and the Navy as well. But the Army has uh, the lead on the glide body for the hypersonic missile under development. So there's going to be uh, some big tests in uh, 2021, two big ones, one in the third quarter of 2021 uh, and another in the first quarter of 2022. So that's something that's pretty exciting to watch. Uh, if that's successful, then I believe the Army will be on the path to uh, fielding a launcher and the missile to a unit, um, possibly by the end of this year as well. I think the other thing to watch is obviously um, the Army leadership team over the last administration was really strong. They were kind of seen as the dream team. Uh, they came together. They worked really well together. That was Mark Esper, uh, General Milley, uh, then Vice Chief of Staff uh, General McConville and uh, Secretary McCarthy who was undersecretary when they um, were all in a team together. Um, but that band has been broken up. McCarthy is no longer there. Um, Esper is no longer there. 
So it'll be interesting to see uh, who comes in uh, joining uh, McConville, who's the last member of that team, really, uh, to see what they can they can accomplish. You know, a lot of this stuff is guided by personalities and relationships. Uh, so something definitely to keep our eye on. Yeah, there's that old Washington saying that uh, policy are people and people are policy. So personalities matter. In that regard, I think we're all going to be watching uh, how Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, Mark Milley, uh, works with another uh, former Army officer uh, coming in, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. So that's something that personally I'll be tracking quite a bit. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, really appreciate everyone taking the time. Of course, all these stories will be continuing to be covered on defensenews.com. We'll see you next time. I'm Aaron Mehta. That's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.